I don't know whether you've noticed uh, in the Gospels and the accounts of Jesus how often he was eating and drinking with people. In uh, Luke chapter 7, and uh, Doug's going to work the magic today, uh, this is what Jesus said. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a, deepen, a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I get a feeling Jesus was quite proud of uh, being thought of like that, that he was seen as someone who was eating and drinking, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And people noticed, people noticed that Jesus loved meeting with people around a table. He loved eating with people and he loved drinking with people. And if you look through the Gospels, you will see how many different people that happened to. And so in our series, we're going to look at a few of those moments and try and discover what that means for us today in terms of how we interact with people and in how we convey the gospel to people around tables. Of course, many incidents may come to your mind, and he did love tax collectors. I mean, we have the incident with Matthew, of course, when he called Matthew to follow him, and immediately he went to Matthew's house, and Matthew was throwing a party for all his tax collector friends. And then, of course, we have the beautiful story with Zacchaeus as well, another tax collector where Jesus went and had tea with him, apparently, according to the Sunday school song that I always used to sing. Do you remember that song? Yes, you're going to come to my house for tea. I don't think the, God, the Bible mentions tea at all, actually, but it rhymed, didn't it? So we, we used to very well sing it as well. But here we meet the resurrected Jesus. And once again, here he is walking with these disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he sits at a table and he breaks bread with them. Next week, we'll look at the incident on a beach when he met his disciples who had given up hope as well and gone fishing, perhaps reflecting on all that had happened and how he cooked food for them on a beach and he shared it with his followers who had gone back to do what they did when he first called them. And also in a locked room, of course, he appeared to his followers after the resurrection and what did they give him? They gave him something to eat. In fact, the gospel writers tell us that it was a piece of broiled fish. I mean, what a weird thing to give, but nevertheless, there was Jesus eating a piece of broiled fish after his resurrection. And the writer says he ate it in their presence, primarily to prove that he wasn't a ghost, as some of them thought, because as he says, Luke 24, 39, a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. It was just to carry on what he had always done. And this Eating and drinking was a very familiar part of the life of Jesus, as we would expect, because it's generally a very familiar part for all of us as well, eating and drinking. And Jesus, of course, was the expert at making room for others around a table. And it seems to me that whenever he sat around a table, something happened and someone changed as a result of the encounter in this very simple, ordinary way. It seems like eating and drinking is important to how the good news of Jesus, the coming of the kingdom, the growing as a follower of Jesus happens. In fact, that's how the church grew. Acts chapter 2, Doug, thank you. Next slide, please. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It was a familiar territory that the early church would take on exactly what Jesus did, that the table became a place of, of evangelism, of mission, of transformation as they broke bread in their homes. When it talks about being glad with glad hearts, it means exuberant joy, wild joy, ecstatic delight, exultation, exhilaration. Sincere hearts means literally, it means to without rocks, <laughs> which is a bit weird, but it just means there's nothing in the way. It's uncomplicated. They're unhindered. There's no stumbling block around this table where they have glad and sincere hearts. That's the way that they ate around this table. Because Jesus and the early church seemed to know that around a table, it became a sign of the kingdom of God. It became a place of joy. It became a place where transformation of opportunity 
where we begin to glimpse the now and the not yet of this kingdom that Jesus talks about and where people came to know who he was as well. There's a lovely little book by Tim Chester uh, called A Meal with Jesus. And uh, he says this. Uh, Thanks, Doug. You're ahead of me. Well done. Uh, I'll just expand on, on, on the quote. The resurrection of Jesus, he says, is the promise and beginning of the renewal of all things. And the future is a physical future on a renewed earth. It's a future with broiled fish. It's good news, isn't it? I don't know what broiled fish is, but I'm sure it will be fine. We will enjoy not just food, but cooking and fermenting and brewing. Isaiah 25 verse 6 says, On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. Now, it's a bit of a challenge for someone who's a teetotal that one day I might have to drink wine and uh, go back on the promise I made when I was a very young kid. But, you know, some of you are smiling now because you're looking forward to that day, aren't you? I can tell. Better wine than you've ever drunk before is going to be there in the kingdom. And for those of us who've never had it, well, we'll get a taste of it as well. And so it seems to me this is a great decision to to make room around a table, to invite others to practice what it's going to look like in the kingdom of God. Eating and drinking becomes the norm, it seems. And coming back to this story of Emmaus, here's a glimpse of how Jesus was able to make room and what making room around our tables might look like when we practice this same discipline. Because this meal changed the direction of two downcast followers of Jesus They don't know what to do other than get away from Jerusalem and all that has happened. They didn't recognize Jesus in this first encounter, maybe through tears, maybe through the pain of unbelief. But the text says they had hoped that he, Jesus, was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And now it seems that all their hope had been lost. It seems hard to imagine why they didn't stay in Jerusalem, because if you read the gospel accounts, of course, there were reports of the risen Jesus by some of our women. They even say that. And yet they were still walking away. There was an empty tomb which had been witnessed. There was no body inside that tomb. The angels who were at the tomb were telling the followers that Jesus was alive. It was even confirmed by some men, but they still didn't believe it. They still walked away. And even though the risen Jesus had told the women at the tomb to tell the men to go and wait in Galilee, there they will see me. These two followers, one named Cleopas, named and shamed, the other one, possibly his wife, is is what scholars seem to indicate. They, despite being told to go to Galilee, went to Emmaus. Nothing wrong, perhaps, with their sat-nav, but something seriously wrong with their sense of direction and their sense of expectation as well. But let's not blame them too much. Because this story has to confront you and me with, well, where would we have walked to? Or perhaps even more important, where are we walking to? For those of us who know that Jesus is alive and present through his spirit. Where are we walking to now? And in a very strange encounter, instead of revealing himself, Jesus asked them what they've been talking about. And Jesus seems a bit harsh on them to start with, doesn't he? Luke 24 verse 25 says, How foolish you are and how slow to believe. But then, of course, he carefully explained from Moses to the prophets about who he was. But it seems that even the explanation wasn't enough for them and so from verse 28 you might want to just pick up your bible again as they approached the village to which they were going jesus continued on as if he were going further but they urged him strongly stay with us for it is nearly evening the day is almost over so he went in to stay with them when he was at the table with them he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And so in this very simple act, in this breaking of the bread, it seems like their hard hearts were broken. 
sat at the table, their clouded eyes were opened. And in that moment, he disappeared from their sight. This time, not because they were walking away, but this time because I think they got it. They understood that Jesus was alive. That for them in that moment, faith had become enough to convince them of the truth that Jesus was alive. Just as Mary heard her name in the garden and that was enough to convince her that Jesus was alive. Just like Thomas, who was very bold and saying, unless I put my fingers there and see it and feel it. But when he confronted Jesus, as Jesus turned up and Thomas was there, it was enough for, G for Thomas just to see him, my Lord and my God. See, faith becomes enough in these moments, enough to reverse their direction straight away, enough to recover their hope, enough to renew their strength, to go back the journey again, even in the dark, but now with the light of Jesus burning again inside them, off to Jerusalem to join the mission Jesus invites everyone to join him with. Now, I'm not a connoisseur of art, but I did come across this painting by uh, Diego Velazquez. Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. Painted in about 1620-ish, apparently. And this is... Uh, the, the Emmaus story uh, painted for us, the kitchen maid with the supper of Emmaus. And what's intriguing about this picture is that no one is sat around this table. It's like painted at the moment when suddenly everybody who was around the table has gone. And the maid is looking a bit bemused and a bit astonished by the fact that there were people sat here a few moments ago and now nobody is there. But of course you notice up in the top left corner, it's like that is what happened a few moments before this painting, that there were people sat around the table. Apparently uh, when somebody bought the painting and restored it, they chopped off the other corner. There used to be another disciple sat on the other side of the table, but it has vanished now. But there's Jesus, and you can just about see the hand, hopefully, of the uh, other follower on the left. But there's this moment when suddenly something has happened. Jesus has disappeared from their sight. The two walkers have gone, left the table to walk back home. But of course, there's something on the table, isn't there? Have you noticed? It's just a white cloth, isn't it? It's almost an echo of the empty tomb, isn't it? Which wasn't empty because the linen was still lying there. And it's almost like here again, we see where Jesus has been, but now he's not there, but he's alive and with us. And those two followers have gone back home back to Jerusalem to see what is happening next. See, suddenly everything's changed. Faith became enough and everything changed. Not only the direction of, of travel back to Jerusalem, but the direction of their lives was transformed around that table in that moment. Faith was restored, hope was renewed and love was refreshed in that moment. So there's no need to carry on sitting around that table. It's time to get back. And I think this is the potential of making room, of hospitality is the word we would say. The word hospitality from the Greek is philoxenia, which means being a friend of a stranger. It's the opposite to xenophobia, which is the fear of the stranger. So hospitality is philoxenia, the, the love of a stranger, the outsider, the foreigner, the refugee, the asylum seeker, the people we don't know. Hospitality is a way of turning strangers into neighbors and neighbors into family. And around this table, Jesus did exactly that. Brought them back to be part of the next part of this story. And so when we make room around a table, we can not only see Jesus, but we can help others to see him as well. 
Of course, it's a place to get to know one another, to share stories, to express the unity of faith, to blur the edges of guest and host, to discover the mutual respect and understanding we can have for one another. It strengthens our witness as well. The Catholic priest, Henry Nouwen, he, he says this in his little book called Reaching Out. Hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place. And it seems that's exactly what happened around that table on the road to Emmaus. Jesus wasn't there to change them, but he was there to create a space where change took place. See, the two disciples think that Jesus is their guest around that table. It's them who've invited him to stop and stay. But the reality is, of course, that Jesus is the host around that table. He's the change bringer. And if you invite him to stop and let him come in and eat with you, then your life will be transformed. The lives of people around the table will change. He is patient with us, just as he was with Cleopas and the unnamed walker. But he gives us an opportunity to encounter him afresh. And then we too build faith and confidence in his story. Making room for Jesus, the person they thought was the stranger at their table, is the friend they've been longing for again. It's a glimpse of the kingdom when our eyes are open to the reality of who he is. This isn't a place of entertainment. It is a place of hospitality. This is an act of generosity, expecting nothing in return, but in, in inviting a response to the love of Jesus. So where are you heading? Where is your life heading? Where are you walking? Emmaus, away, doubting. You had hoped that this was the answer to all the prayers that you've ever prayed. Or maybe back to Jerusalem, convinced, certain, confident, with courage to once again follow Jesus. And it all happens around a table. And this morning we're going to be around a table, making room for Jesus to make himself known to us through the bread and through the drink, to let it transform us for the one who's made room for you around this table longs for you to know his presence and his power today. Yeah, those followers, they turned around, didn't they? It's what the word repentance means, of course, to turn around, to start walking a different direction, the direction back to where Jesus wants us to be, with him, taking hold of the mission that he's given for us to do.